The title of this week's story portion, Lech Lecha, in the English it translates as, Go forth for yourself. And it's taken from Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, through chapter 17, verse 27. And if you're not familiar with it, it begins with Abram's command from Yahweh to journey to the promised land. And we find it's this initial contact between Yahweh and Abram, the one that's going to become later known as the father of the faith. And we find that he's given a promise here that he's been entrusted with, if he'll be obedient to answer to the call to Lech Laka. And when you look at the wording of this phrase, it's quite interesting because in the Hebrew, it seems to infer that for him to go forth, Yahweh is already telling him it's for his own good. It's for his own benefit that he go forth and do this. And yet the Hebrew can also mean that phrase, leka, lek leka, go forth for yourself. It can infer that he's literally going forth to himself. Go forth to yourself. And it seems to indicate that on this journey as Abraham is being obedient to go forth, what's in front of him is who Yahweh's called him to be. He's literally going to who Yahweh created him to be. And without this journey, he will never arrive there and become the man of faith that he was intended to be unless he's obedient to Lech Laka. It's a journey where Abram will find himself and step into the role that Yahweh called him to do. Well, how many of you realize the same is true for you and I? There is a role, there's an anointing, there's a gifting that you were created in order to fill in the body as a whole. But unless you lek laka, it's there, it's in front of you, but without the journey necessary, you'll never fulfill that. Many are called, few are chosen. And so as we begin to look at this, it's quite amazing to me because when you look at where Abram is being called forth from, it's referred to as Ur of the Chaldees. But we know when we go back and we look at the previous chapter, it's literally the locale that we now know later as Babylon or Babel. And so we find that Abram is the first, this is the first record we see in the scriptures of a call that echoes all the way into the book of Revelation. Come out of her, my people. Come out of Babylon. And we see this in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. It says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you, under, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. And it's quite interesting because as believers, we'd like to think, well, we're not a part of that. We're separate. We're holy. We've arrived. And yet all the way at the very end, in the midst of everything that's happening, the call's going forth, get out of there. Come out of her, my people. He's not talking to the unbeliever. He's talking to my people, come out, lest you be partakers of her sins and her plagues. And yet to truly understand how to fulfill this command, Abram's example and pattern must be investigated because this is the example we're given. And it's quite interesting because we find that this journey collectively, I believe, is about the body, literally my people, Finding or being restored to who we were created to be from the beginning, just like Abram does on this journey. Literally in front of us, we see a picture, a model to fill up the body of Messiah. This is what this journey is about. And as we begin to look at this, how many realize that if you've been, especially in the Hebrew roots, it's kind of a catchphrase coming out of Babylon and we tag it with a lot of different ideas and concepts of what we think that means to come out of Babylon. There's many different ways that this could be defined. You can look at it from the aspect of the pagan rituals that have been intertwined with many beliefs of the believing community, with the holidays and the calendar, with terminology and words and names. We can look at it from the aspect of the financial worldly system, the powers that be that control all the nations. It's this conglomerate system that you could refer to as Babylon. But how many of you realize that if you miss the purpose of why you're called out, then you'll never truly be out. There are many people that can say, oh, I, I figured out the matrix. I figured out how to get out. But yet if they miss the understanding that Abram was being given right here, the reason he was being called out, then you've never truly gotten out. You've never truly lek laka. And you can look at this example, and it's seen not only here with Abram and his family, but it's also seen with the first generation that leaves Egypt. Egypt and Babylon are synonymous in the typology. There's a generation that physically leaves Egypt, 
They leave it all behind and they head off to what Yahweh has promised and intended for them, but they never make it to who they were supposed to be. They never make it to the inheritance and the blessings and the promises that they were promised at the beginning because they didn't understand why they were leaving. They didn't understand the purpose of why they were being called out and they never fulfilled that and so they don't attain it. And we see this with Abram as well here. How many realize that his father, Terah, a brother, they all left Ur of the Chaldees, but they never make it actually to the promised land. Many are called, but few are chosen. And so we're going to take a look at this. And as we dive into the Hebrew language, I believe you're going to see it a little differently, hopefully. And you'll understand that when this call is going forth and it's echoing to come out of her, my people, to come out of this place that's known as Babylon, hopefully you'll walk away with a different understanding of what it is Yahweh is calling his people towards and for. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now Yahweh had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show you. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless you, and make thy name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Well, we're going to focus on that phrase, get thee out, is the way it's translated in the King James. And it's from that Hebrew phrase we've already said, lek leka. And when you begin to look at this, you'll find that this phrase, lek leka, and it's quite interesting because it's, a repeat, it's repeated in the Hebrew, lamed kaf, lamed kaf. And whenever you see that repetition, it kind of stands out. This word, it seems like, what is this? What's this statement that's being made here? Well, in the Hebrew, we find that it has a numerical value of 100. It's the same value as the word min in Hebrew. It's Strong's number 4327, and it's translated as meaning kind or species. It indicates something that shares common characteristics And we find this term is often used in Genesis, and it lays the foundation for creation, that everything will produce after its kind, after its mean. And we see that this mean, this kind that he begins to elaborate on in the creation story of Genesis 1 through chapter 1 through chapter 2, it seems to be that it's boundaries that are literally being put into place. And that these mean, these these kinds, these species, it's separating and distinguishing all of creation. But the lesson, the basis of this whole separation that he's revealing here in Genesis 1 is that the seed will produce after its kind. And we see that this is somehow, it's connected here. And you may think, well, what does this have to do with Abram coming forth out of Babylon? Well, if you'll just hang on, we're going to lay this foundation And as we continue to look at this word mean, this species, kind, these boundary lines that would separate all of creation and teach us a fundamental principle, how many of you realize that everything in the kingdom is based off of the law of sowing and reaping? Well, it would seem then that the seed producing after its kind becomes a fundamental principle to understand in this concept of everything being based off of the law of sowing and reaping. Because I can understand the law of sowing and reaping, but if I don't understand that everything is going to produce after its kind, well, then I've missed a fundamental part. Because I understand I'm planting seed, I'm expecting that I'm going to reap something, but if I don't plug in the understanding, and it seems really simple from the natural, but how many realize from the spiritual, a lot of times we don't plug in this understanding that if I don't plant the type of seed that I'm looking for it to be reproducing, I may get a harvest that I wasn't anticipating And I may be getting a harvest of something that I did not want. In fact, when we look at this this concept of the mean, the kind, the species, these boundary lines being established at the beginning of creation, when you look closer at Genesis chapter 2, it seems that this is one of the first tests, if you will, or responsibilities that Adam is given to understand. Because we find that all of creation is brought before Adam to name And yet after he names all of creation based off of their mean, based off of their kind, their species, their characteristics, we find that he makes a statement that there is not one in all of this that's a proper helpmate. There's not one in all of these characteristics, these species, these kinds that have been brought before him that are capable of coming alongside him in order for him to fulfill the kingdom mandate that he was given, to be fruitful, to multiply, to subdue, and have dominion. And when you understand the role of Adam as king, priest, representative on the earth of Yahweh and what he's charged with, 
Now you can begin to understand, well, it seems part of understanding and walking in that role is understanding that the seed will produce after its kind and being able to look at it and understand what is good seed or what is seed that's not appropriate for what I'm trying to do in order to fulfill the kingdom mandate I've been given. He's a seed inspector, a fruit inspector. And so we see this plainly in the physical. We understand that if I plant apple seeds... I'm going to get an apple tree. I'm not going to get something else. And yet the same principles, how many of you realize, also apply spiritually. And we find that the boundary lines are only crossed physically that would compromise these types of things after they've been compromised spiritually. And so we find that to function in the role of a king and priest like Adam was created to, And it seems as if this is part of the role that Abram's being entrusted with. He's being told to lek laka, to go forth. And it seems to infer that on this journey as he goes forth, he's going to find himself. He's literally going to become and step into the role that he was created to be. Well, how many of you realize that you were called to be kings and priests, a nation of kings and priests? And so it seems this lek laka, this journey, is about Abram stepping into this role. Well, how many of you realize in order for him to step into this role, it's going to require you and I and Abram to be capable of discerning these boundary lines, to walk in discernment concerning seeds or words that are presented. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 16, we're told that you shall know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? And this is a statement by the Messiah, and it's quite interesting to me. I feel as if he's almost incredulous with those that are listening. Like, don't you get this? You understand this from the natural. This should be an easy concept. But yet we, when we plug this into the spiritual, why are we thinking that we can gather the inheritance, the blessings, and the promises? Grapes and figs were part of what was promised in the promised land from the thorns and the thistles which is associated with the curse and the fall of Adam. To remain in this state, you can't produce the grapes or the figs, the promises and the inheritance. And so you may be asking the question and thinking, well, what does this have to do with coming out of Babel or Babylon? Well, it's quite interesting because as Abram is being obedient to answer this call, when you go back and you begin to study what Babel or Babylon was involved in, both in Abram's day as well as now, Babel was known for being engaged in and crossing the very boundary lines that were established at creation on every level. Spiritually, physically, mentally. And we find as Abram's being called out of this, he's being reminded, Abram, you're being charged with once again establishing those boundary lines into place and to understand that everything that you might be presented with, you're going to have to be able to tell and have discernment of what will enable you to fulfill the mandate that you've been given. What will enable you to go forth, be fruitful, multiply, subdue, and have dominion? And it seems to be inferring that to stay there, to stay in Babel or Babylon, to allow those boundaries to continually be crossed and manipulated and compromised, that literally what has happened as an individual that was created to be a king and priest in the earth, you actually give up that authority. You give up that role, you give up that mantle, and you're unable to fulfill the responsibility to be fruitful, subdue, have dominion, specifically in regard to the word of Yahweh. And we find that it seems to be because we haven't shown competence regarding the first responsibility we're given. The first time we see Adam actually walking this out is when all of creation comes before him. This is the exact thing he does. He looks, he names them, he understands them by their characteristics, but he makes a statement. None of these are capable, though, of allowing me to fulfill the mandate I've been given, to be fruitful, to walk in dominion, to subdue, and to have authority. And so we find that this calling out of Abram's being likened unto the mean, the kinds, literally being separated again, and boundaries are being put into place. And so when we see this call going forth in the book of Revelation, we can't separate it from what was happening here with Abram. The call in the book of Revelation to come out of her, my people, how many realize once again it's Yahweh, just like at the beginning of Genesis 1, he's setting these boundaries into place, and you're going to be separated based off the characteristics, your ability to subdue, have dominion, to literally carry and be fruitful regarding the word of Yahweh. 
And so we find that as Abram is separated from this group, he's being recognized this is an individual that is capable of doing that. Now, when we look at the root of this word, this phrase, lek leka, it's quite interesting because lamed kaf is the, the first word. It has a value, a numerical value of 50. Well, 50, when you plug it in, 50 represents the jubilee. It's about a restoration, something being set free and restored that previously had been lost. And so once again, it seems to refer that as long as Abram's content to stay in Babylon, as long as my people are content to stay in Babylon, then you're lost, you're cut off from who you were created to be. But the moment you step out, the moment you lack Laka and you go forth, then we find there's a season, it's a restoration, something's set free, something's unlocked, so to speak. Now let's break apart this phrase, lek leka, even further. It's spelled with the lamed and the kaf. The Hebrew letter lamed indicates to teach, to instruct, to learn. How many realize that there's a season of instruction first that Abram goes through? He has to be taught he has to be given an understanding of how to properly judge and walk this out in order to be this kingdom of kings and priests, in order to understand that these boundary lines, that they're in place and they're not going to be compromised, in order to be an individual that can be entrusted with guarding the gates. Remember, Abram later is told that you and your seed will control the gateways and is dealing with these spiritual gateways so that they could understand that whatever they choose to unleash, whatever they choose to speak forth, it's literally going to open that spiritual gateway and they're going to see it made manifest. And so to understand, you want to be careful regarding the seed that you release. Make sure it's the right seed. Make sure it's the seed that will cause the word of Yahweh to be what goes forth. In fact, the letter Lamed is connected to the letter Kaf in this word, Lek Leka. The Kaf indicates the palm of the hand or the sole of the foot. It's synonymous with inheritance, possession, authority, ownership. And in fact, the sages connect this letter Kaf as well with the power of the spiritual realm being made manifest into the physical so when Abram is told to lek leka, all of this is wrapped up in this statement. Abram, when you step into the role that you were created to be, when you begin to walk in this power and authority that I first entrusted Adam with, and now you're willing to do the same, you literally are going to become that gateway, that doorway, that connection between the spiritual realm and the physical realm, and it was pointing towards what the Messiah would do. But Abram, in order to do this, you've got to be taught, you've got to be instructed, you've got to learn, you've got to understand, because this, there's a responsibility and an accountability that's going along with this. How many realize that it starts with our thoughts and our words? If we aren't diligent here, then eventually, if we're not careful regarding these boundary lines, if we're not careful regarding the words that enter, the thoughts that enter, the things that we allow to come in here, if these boundary lines, we allow them to be crossed, it won't take much eventually with this prolonged contamination and compromising of these boundary lines that then it'll begin to manifest physically as well. Physical boundaries will be compromised. And so it seems that the calling out of Abram, as well as my people in Revelation, from this locale, is specifically dealing with the jubilee that's taking place. It's a restoration of something that had been lost. It's an unbinding, a setting free. And when obedient to, to the call to come out of her, it's then that you and I and Abram are taught, instructed regarding the inheritance that Yahweh has for him, how to take ownership of that promise and how to walk in that authority. We find that a lot of believers are quick to claim that we're kings and priests. They're quick to claim that they, they want the authority, they want the dominion, they want the power. They want to be able to, to walk in that, and yet we're reminded that the first letter of Lech Lecha, first they must be taught. First they must be instructed. First there must be this season where they learn how to walk in this. In fact, we see that Abram's given a promise that he doesn't see in fulfillment even in his lifetime. He sees increments of it, but it's through this generational walking that they see the promise fully walked out. 
And so we find that if this is the pattern set with Abram, then it would seem to indicate this is the same promise given to you and I and the generation of my people who as well will come out. Because Abram sets the pattern. It sets the standard. If this is the way you come out of Babel, if this is what Yahweh intends for you to do when you're called and now you can be chosen, then it's the same pattern for you and I. In Revelation, you're told as well to come out, to lek laka, to go forth for yourself in order to walk in this as well. Well, let's take a look at that word Babylon or Babel, where he's being called from. And it's interesting to me because in the English we separate it. Oh, that's the Tower of Babel, but then the kingdom later and in the book of Revelation, it's Babylon. It's two different. But in the Hebrew, it's the same word. It's one word. It's the same location with the same interest, with the same intent. It's Strong's number 894, Babel, and it's translated as confusion by mixing. And when you look in the English translation, it seems as if, oh, that's because the, the languages were mixed and confounded, and therefore that's why it's called Babel. And yet it was called Babel before it was ever, the languages were ever mixed and Yahweh ever came down. So we have to continue to look at this word, Babel. It's from the root word, Strong's number 1101, Bilal, and it means to mix, to mingle, to confuse, to confound. But it can also infer to pour over, to wet or moisten, to flow as water, to be anointed, to saturate, to fill something until that something, whatever's being filled, cannot absorb any more. And when you look at this term, well, immediately to mix, to mingle, to confuse, it's, we, we focus on, well, that's the negative aspect of this. And yet this same word, Bilal, can also mean to be anointed, to be saturated with an anointing. It's quite interesting because often we think of anointing from the blessed aspect, to be anointed by Yahweh, to receive his anointing. And yet Babylon, Babel, comes from that same root, and it's teaching you that this is also a place that has an anointing. It's not his anointing, but it has an anointing. It's an anointed place. It's dedicated to something. And we find that in its name, we, the mixing, the mingling, the confusion, Babylon literally is the place that's anointed and dedicated, dedicated to bringing forth confusion. Now you can understand why my people would be called out from this place. As long as you're here, it's the place where you're going to be continually saturated and filled and anointed with something that would bring confusion and disarray and would confound you. We find that Babylon has an anointing as well. In fact, it seems that the very way that one is confused and then mingled is by being exposed and mixed with this anointing of Babylon. And if lured in by this, the individual becomes so filled with this mixed anointing, Bilal, that they cannot absorb anything else. Remember, it's from the root word. It means to literally saturate something, to fill it until it cannot absorb anything else. If you stick in Babylon long enough, if you stay around and you don't lek laka, there will come a point where there is no room for anything else. You've become so saturated by this anointing of confusion and mixing and mingling and confounding. In other words, there's no room or ability to hear and house the word or the promise from Yahweh because you are so saturated already. And when you look at this term, Bilal, the root of Babel, it's quite interesting because immediately... We look at it, okay, well, it's negative. You don't want that. It's completely over here and it's associated with Babylon. And yet this root word, Bilal, the majority of time that it's seen is it's specifically associated with the meal or the minka offering of the tabernacle. This is where you see the Bilal, that they would take the flour and they would completely saturate it, mix it, mingle it, Bilal, with oil. We have to ask ourselves, well, what does the minka offering represent? The minka offering is translated as meaning a gift or a tribute. Specifically, the minka offering was a tribute to the king. By bringing the minka offering, the Israelites were confessing their loyalty and literally their vassalage to Yahweh as their king. That they would operate as a king and priest on the earth, but the true king, the one who their allegiance, their, their loyalty was to, was to Yahweh, the great king. 
And every time they would bring the minka offering, this is what it was symbolic of. It was a constant reminder, Yahweh, you're our king. We're confessing our loyalty to you, our obedience, our connection to you. And yet we find that now when we plug in this concept to the meaning of this place, Babel, you can find now the intent of why Nimrod would have named this locale this. He names it Babel with the understanding that as the people come and they're a part of this system that he's creating, he will so confound them by the, and confuse them by this mixing. They'll be saturated until they can hold nothing else. But the intent was that they would literally become a vassal or an entity, a vessel, if you will, that would have their loyalty to him. To be found as one still within the grasp of Babylon indicates that our tribute, our minka, our loyalty, our vassalage is offered to another. You no longer are offering up the minka to the king. Hence the adamant call, I believe, to come out of her, my people. It's interesting, in Matthew chapter 20, Yeshua makes a statement that you're to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and you're to render unto Yahweh's what is his. And so it causes us to ask the question, who do you belong to? You're a literal walking offering. You're you're to be a minka offering, and we're going to delve into this even further. You're to be a minka offering, but depending on who has anointed you, depending on what you've been filled with, what you've been saturated with, that's where your loyalty is. That's who you are a vassal of, whether you have the understanding or not. Hence the reason Babylon will try to confuse you and confound you so that you've completely lost sight. You don't understand what you've just done. And yet the Messiah makes a statement, there's going to be a time where it'll be rendered unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto Yahweh what is his. In Leviticus chapter 2 verse 4, we read about this minka offering where you see this root word balal. It says, and if thou bring an oblation of a meat offering, a minka, baked in the oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mingled, balal, saturated, completely mixed and anointed with oil or unleavened wafers anointed with oil. Well, let's look at this word fine flour, the ingredients of the minka offering. In the English, it just looks that they make a cake, they bring it to the altar, and that's all there is to it. And yet Yahweh spends quite a bit of time teaching and instructing the priests of how to bring these offerings, what they were to be made of. And there's a reason, because each one was a lesson to Israel. It was a teaching tool, because they missed it. They didn't understand. You're supposed to be a kingdom of priests, but because you've rejected that, now we're going to institute this whole teaching tool so you could hopefully understand by the end of this, this is what you were supposed to be doing. Let's look at the word for fine flour. It's Strong's number 5560, solet. It's translated as fine flour. Yet the roots of this word are debated because it's very difficult to see where it stemmed from. It's spelled samik lamed tav. Most scholars agree that the samik lamed root is connected to the Hebrew word salal, root stem, Strong's number 5549, which means to lift up, to build up, to raise something up, or to move to and fro. This root salal is the same root that we get the term sulam from, the latter, what Jacob saw in the dream that he has. Literally, the... (laughs) 